What's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Bass and Hannah podcast. Today is a special day because I have my dear friend and colleague, Jeremiah Shannis, with us um, to give us some insight on the Canadian real estate space, uh, as well as just some broader entrepreneurial uh, advice and commentary about somebody that works directly in the real estate space. This is a special one for me because this is home turf. Uh, we're talking about Canadian real estate. Jeremiah, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. He's concerned because yeah. I told him about the lightning round. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so the format for today's podcast is similar to, to our other guest podcast. Uh, we're going to go through a lightning round together. Well, actually, before that, we're going to have Jeremiah briefly introduce himself and what he does. Uh, then we're going to go through a lightning round where we're going to fire off five questions at each other uh, and the, you have to either answer truthfully or typically, normally we do shots, but Jeremiah, look at this specimen of health right here. Uh, he's like, let's do push-ups instead. So if you don't want to answer a question, we're going to do 20 push-ups. Uh, and what we'll do just for continuity is we'll wrap up all the push-ups at the end and then you have to settle the bet before we start. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay, so with that, uh, Jeremiah, thank you so much for being here. Uh, why don't we just start with you giving a brief intro of who you are and what you do? Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. This is fun. I'm not looking forward to the lightning round, but regardless. Uh, You'll be good. <laughs> so, my name is Jeremiah Shamus. Uh, I'm the founder of the Private Capital Investment Group at Colliers. Um, effectively, what I do is I sell buildings on behalf of owners. So, land and buildings, which of course you know. Yes. I've been working with you, but I lead a group of uh, nine professionals now, and I have one partner in Montreal, and we effectively are working as advocates for owners who sell or who own commercial real estate, rather. Which, uh, because Jeremiah being very humble, so Colliers is probably the largest uh, seller of commercial land in Canada, in yeah. Canada. Uh, and Jeremiah started and leads that group, so... You're like king shit in the... <laughs> I got a long way to go. In the real estate brokerage world, okay. Humility is also one of his strengths. <laughs> um, so with that, I'd like to kick off the lightning round. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go first? I think I want you to open these up because I need to know how hard I should get into my question. <laughs> okay, fine. Uh, first question. Have you ever done Molly? No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you answered it, so you're good. Stop, uh, it's your turn. All right. You snore. Nice uh, and easy. Oh, do I snore? That one's pretty easy. Uh, yes, I snore when I'm, when I'm like overly tired. Normally, I'm not a snorer, but with a bad for your wife. Yeah, <laughs> if I had a big night or something, I'll definitely like. Uh, I'm trying to warm it, ease into it. You're just like, sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to drugs. Yeah, no. <laughs> uh, okay. What is the most money you've made on a single deal? On a single deal? A single deal. Uh, seven figures. Sure. Nice. We'll count that as an answer. Okay, yeah. your turn. Um, you clap after the plane lands? <laughs> Bro, you're going to need to spice your shit up. Uh, no, I don't. I do you. Not. Yeah, I do not clap <laughs> after the plane lands. It's just the pilot doing Job, but I am very grateful that we're on the ground again. Sure. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, okay. I feel, I feel bad. Mine are so much like uh, harder than yours. Uh, who's the worst client you've ever had? That's <laughs> me. <laughs> we still make it work. Look, we're still friends and we're, we're doing podcasts. <laughs> uh, okay, your turn. I was joking. Alright, we're gonna assume that that's a no answer. No, I can answer that one. Yeah. There yeah, I won't name names, but Fair. there have been bad clients okay. and you sometimes have to fire your client. How, how do you deal with that? Actually, side barber, like how do you like when how do you know like what makes somebody a bad client and what do you do in that scenario? Good question. I mean ultimately when someone asks you to do something unethical, they aren't a client you want. Fair. So when someone asks you to do that, you have to Plainly say that no, and if they insist on it, you have to, you know, 
show them the door. Yeah. And yeah. say, listen, it's never going to be worth my reputation. One deal is never worth that. And on a side note, there are times you have to quote fire your clients, but it's only for you know extenuating these circumstances. Right. Right. And you still maintain the relationship, I'm assuming. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah. except for the you know unethical ones. You probably don't want them in your life, no. anyways. Never. Okay. Fair. Fair. Okay. Your turn. Um, mine are like so easy, I guess. Yeah. I mean, how about a skill testing? Mm-hmm. Name a primate besides monkeys and apes. Besides monkeys and apes? Humans. Aren't humans primates? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Homo sapiens? Yeah. Uh, okay, fair. Um, well, I guess technically it would be a, a, a Neanderthal, right? The prior Homo sapiens. Right, but we're not considered primates? I, that's a good question. I thought I'd talk about that. We'll put that up. Yeah. Uh, is there someone in your office that you absolutely can't stand? No, I don't think so. No. Is it, we have actually a very good culture. Yeah. Also, you're like the head of it, so like if you really don't like that, <laughs> they probably don't last too long. I'm, yeah, I'm not the head, but I'm the head of the private company group. But right. Like we, you know, there's different types of specialties. With different colleagues, and I just a long time ago um, started dealing with a lot of private owners, mm-hmm. and was doing investment only, investment sales uh, for listeners, which means the sale of property, building land. Right. And so, with uh, unfortunately uh, Jeff Arnaldi, who passed away, he was an incredible marketer. Mm-hmm. He came up with the name when I described to him what we were doing. Right. And so that's where the private capital group is in terms of. Very okay, cool. Okay, you got you, your turn. <laughs> yeah. Um, two more of these. Man, mine are so easy. Um, okay, I'll try a harder one. Have you ever been arrested? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> In my like teens, I was not the. You make mistakes when you're young. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, was, it was more like for silly stuff. Like I, I got into and shoplifting and stuff like that, but yeah, wow. yeah. But with the shoplifting one, I did it when I was early, it's probably before my teen years. I was just coming around with the wrong people, yeah. Um, and my dad, so the police actually showed up at my house, wow. And my dad, we were supposed to go to one room, I'll never forget this. And, and my dad was like, You did what? And so he like dragged my ass to the store and made me apologize to the guy. And like, for what I took for my own money. It was like it was a very valuable life lesson. Yeah. And I'm happy I learned it young. Um, but yeah, that was a good question. No stealing candy. No stealing candy. Don't do that. Uh, okay, last question for mine. This is a fun and easy one. What's the most you've ever spent on a closing party or dinner? <laughs> closing party or dinner? Just so you get the idea of like the scale. Wow. Uh, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> If you do a very large deal, then you get a very large yeah. closing dinner. So if you're making seven figures, you're probably yeah, you're, it's a you trip. Get, it's a trip. trip. Yeah, exactly. It's a trip. Yeah. We did yeah, a million dollar commission. We take people on a trip. Fair, fair. All right. Well, one day, one day that will be us. All right. You have last one. You got honors. Um, man, I feel as though I was way too easy with. I didn't take this seriously. I think. Uh, I would say. What's the most you spent on a car? <laughs> um, less than seven figures. Uh, probably like three, just under three fifty. Ooh, yeah. serious car. He's a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. I would have. I would have added actually. What's your favorite car? Because I know you like cars. My favorite car is my. Okay, my favorite car to drive it is the M five because I've, I've had that for a few years and I. Can't think of a better four door, like sedan, and like for performance or anything like that. Yeah. Um, my favorite car in nineteen ninety seven Toyota Supra. Oh, yeah. The Fast and the Furious Paul Walker car, which oh, I, that's amazing. I was blessed enough to buy like a couple of years ago. I've never seen that. Yeah, it, it's coming. It's coming. This summer it'll make an appearance. Incredible. 
Um, well, that's our lightning round, and now people know you a little better. And no push ups. Normal, yeah, no push ups. This is actually the first time we've gone through this with nobody having to do anything. Yeah. That's, 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 I love that your first question is do you do crux? I just want to get it there, you know? Wow. <laughs> I thought I'd be used to this. This is the body is a temple. <laughs> yeah, it's true, it's true. Um, so, uh, I think maybe now just like, I want to kick it into the, like, the proper part of the interview. So, uh, Maybe we'll start like at the beginning and just try to ask you like, uh, where did what did you do for for education? Like, where did you study? What what did you study? Like, just to get a chronology of, of like, people getting to know you. No, that's fair enough. Um, I in my high school career, I really enjoyed math. You know, I was affected by and the calculus teaching in the class, and so I knew I was going to do something with numbers. But my entire family was doctors. Right. My grandfather was an eye surgeon. Father was a doctor, one of my great uncles. So I was thought this is definitely what I need to do, even though I was in grade 10 and I specifically remember my dad saying, Don't be a doctor, son. <laughs> <laughs> but I still I love the idea of helping people. Um, you know, my father grew up with a very difficult uh, start of his life, which is why he became a doctor. And I always had fond memories of my grandfather uh, stepping in his office. And he helped so many people in the community. I grew up in a small northern Ontario town close to Lake Superior on the border of Michigan, Sault Ste. Marie, oh, and wow. the Sioux. Yeah. Um, and so I always wanted to do that. Um, but I think I went to university for, for, um, for biology, effectively, and kinesiology. Okay. And because I enjoyed sports, I grew up as a track runner. And I didn't really quite enjoy it as much. I was on the rowing team at Western, uh, where I went to school, and I remember coming back from rowing practice, which, if you don't know, it's at 5 a.m. every morning. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. when we were younger, we used to go out with our friends and then go to rowing practice, so you sometimes didn't really sleep. Yeah, like you're just that's you're outside the side of the boat. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, listen, I was never that extreme, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was kind of a, a fun time. But I still specifically remember I was sitting in physiology class and learning about the renal system and going, okay, I can't do this for six years. Right. So I started taking uh, business courses. I had some older older cousins who were in the commercial real estate space in the U.S. You know, they worked for major investment banks doing real estate investment banking. And so I learned a lot about it from them. I uh, just happened upon it and started to move my way towards real estate. But I graduated... Um, I was sick for two years, so I actually couldn't go to school. And um, when I graduated, I was late from where my friends were. Mm-hmm. And it was in a great financial crisis. So I initially was trying to do actually investment banking. I started doing uh, Ivy courses at Western, and there was just really no way I was going to get um, a job at that point. So I kind of shifted and started to learn about uh, uh, real estate investment banking, and then started to realize that I actually wanted alumni in my uh, at uh, my university I met with him and he's now a vice chairman at Collier is one of the most senior guys in the industrial side at the time he was having he's probably where I am now but he was at the point where he was trying to figure out you know where he was taking his uh, career to but he had told me he said listen this is real estate um, brokerage investment sales or real estate on some level is actually really great and so he started telling me a lot about it, and really what I learned is that it's a very good uh, medium between analytical, medium between analytical and sales. Right. And so that's what I enjoy because I always like numbers, um, but I love people. Right. And you know, from there, I started wanting to get into that. And the funny thing is, it actually took me eleven months to get a job. Still. Yeah, and I literally cold called every executive across Ontario, from Ottawa to London to Toronto. I met with four different companies. I was like, basically um, going to get a job, no, you know, no matter what. So right. I was, I was on a mission. And yeah, I was, in your mind, you're like, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. And I didn't have any sales experience, which is what they want. So I ended up getting a job in Collier's, uh, which I'm still in there today. And the funny part is, I was the second choice. And I always remind them about that. 
So I got a job as research analyst first. Right. And they called me and said, sorry, you didn't get the job. Come on. <laughs> so I was like, it was the closest I could get to this job. And, and I was so depressed for two weeks. And um, I'm like, okay, I got to figure out if I can get one at another company. And there was, you know, it was right after the great financial crisis. So it wasn't easy. This is always going on. Yeah, and um, I didn't get hired until basically 2010, but they had called me back, I think it was two two weeks to a month after they told me I was no good. And they said, oh, the other person uh, moved on somewhere else, so you are now hired. <laughs> you're, you're good now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're good. I always tell my president that. So you've been at Collier basically your entire working career, yeah. and you've moved on up through it. Um, you know, things I want to highlight or point out are that you did have the experience, but it, you knew what it was, it, you knew this was what you wanted to do, and you like, you pushed through, you pushed through the obstacles, you did the cold calling, you found the people. Um, the reason I bring that up is literally everybody that I talk to has a similar version of that story. It's never handed to you. No. no it's never they're like, oh my God, like, <laughs> would you like to be the head of our private capital group? And no. And uh, you know, make all the all the money and all the all the decisions, uh, but you push through, yeah. right? So that that's that's cool. My first salary was twenty nine thousand two. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I, I, in real estate, and it's like I guess it's like a rite of passage because even when I started at first cap, like my salary was I think it was like forty k, and I was and I graduated from Ivy, and all my friends were making a hundred plus thousand, and I did the same thing. I took a step back to. I really want to be in real estate, so I'll just I'll suck it up and I'll do whatever it is that I need to do. And then so you've got a job with a public company. Yeah, things change. You know? I'm it's doing a couple few deals with them now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're good people. Uh, I was gonna ask what jobs did you have before your current role? So in Collier's research analyst, and then it was a research analyst, and then I joined the team as effectively an assistant. Um, it was a big industrial team at the time but they started with this new thesis of redevelopment land sales. So high rise, right. mid rise, um, higher density land. Because at the time it had been a lot of low rise land. For sure. Like that high rise stuff didn't start until probably like after the great recession. You know, like after. Yeah, the, it, it effectively, yeah. Uh, their home there, boom in Toronto didn't happen until after that. No. Yeah. There is actually a guy who was a mentor to me. His name is Stephen Hope. He was really the person who kind of quote wrote the book on redevelopment land sales. He's been doing it for years. He's now semi-retired, um, but he sold uh, the land for the Trump and then the St. Regis. Right. Um, he sold the Chamber of Law. Like he did a lot of these high density land sales that, yeah. Yeah, that were um, at the time people didn't do it. So he was condo land sale, and but it wasn't really that popular. It had started around 2001, 2002, when the condo market started to move on. There was, you know, the market wasn't much. Like, right. you effectively had 40,000 units sold per year. And at the time, there was, like, maybe 1,000 to 3,000 units. I don't know the exact numbers. But I know eventually that um, balance between low-rise units sold, housing units, right. and, and high-rise, mid-rise, it started to switch in around 2010. Really started to pick up steam, and then in 2015 it kind of took off like yeah. a rocket. Gangbuster, but from 2015 yeah. to the COVID, now. basically, like till like last eight months when they jacked up interest rates. Yeah, it's been on a tear. It's like, been on a tear. Yeah, yeah. absolute tear. We we follow land sales very closely, and if you held land from 2016 till 2022, you effectively made uh, an 11 percent compounded. With absolutely no, no leverage, nothing, and that doesn't include if you take it through an entitlement process and add value. So it's just like literally sitting on land and making eleven percent. Yeah, you just have to be able to. That was downtown, down. yeah. yeah, and you know that's unlevered, so a lot of people made even more. Right, but it's yeah, it was pretty incredible because you had in twenty sixteen you had, um, so there was roughly forty thousand units sold, and you had the lowest number of sales. Sorry. 2018, the lowest number of low rise sales ever mm -hmm. in the history of Toronto. Um, I think only dating back to uh, 1978 or so. There's wow. like 7,000 houses sold. 
or does it flip? So people started to realize that we have this green belt which surrounds Toronto, which protects the city. For sure. And then you have the lake to the south. So you have this natural geographical um, barrier which allows for the city to build up instead of having kind of this kind of urban sprawl, which is good urban planning. No, of course. It's also like closer to transit, it keeps the population. Like you know that 15 minute neighborhood that everybody talks about, like yeah. you know, which is so controversial. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, like people didn't just read urban planning, it's like this came up in 1950, 1920. Like Robert Moses and all these great city builders. Like, yeah, God, like listen, if you can sit in a place that's effectively like a small village and you walk to your grocery store, you walk to here, there's a reason why. But now, now it's controversial because of like I don't know. It's the Nindies. Nindies are the only people that I think make controversial. No, but it's. I think it's a. It's a. It's a far right controversy as well because there's people who say the I think the WEF or some parader is trying to control people. Or, anyways, this is we don't need to talk about this. I mean, we can talk about the, the 15 minute city. If you live in it, you yeah. realize how good it is. Like you also, especially with affordability the way that it is, you need to be close to what you. Have because sometimes a car is not an option. Like I know it's, it's sad to say, but like rent is quite high, and I don't think it's going down. Uh, and we'll get to that. Uh, but if you really need to be around, like you do need to be around what you're doing. You got to be able to do your groceries and go to work and like using transit or walking or whatever. So uh, I conceptually the concept makes perfect sense. Then you get all like the theorists and like the, the special agendas that yeah, I changed. I didn't even realize it happened until it was actually ironically reading Robert Moses' power broker book from yeah. New York, which is great. And and then uh, someone told me, oh, 15 minutes in the city, aren't you there? I'm like, I she answered him, how do you live in 15 minutes? It's actually a quite awesome. Experience. It's convenient. Um, okay. What motivates you from uh, a work perspective? Well, I'm a bit of a deal junkie, so. <laughs> yeah. By the way, his phone is ringing non stop. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's like, this is a oh, uh, my mistake. No, no, it's good. I'm just put it on silent. No, so I, I, I think what motivates me in the work side is actually seeing a complex puzzle come to fruition. So, you know, in the last little while, we've had almost 300 million uh, worth of deals waived and commissions come through. And when you think back to, the first point in which you understood and analyzed that deal and all the work that goes into that, the lawyers, the accountants, uh, the analysts, uh, the developers, the investors, yeah. and all the different kind of metrics and framework that move towards getting the deal done. It's just incredible. And it's this massive puzzle. And, yeah. and development is a lot like that. You know, I still sell apartment buildings and retail plazas and office buildings to right. all these commercial deals. And it's a little bit different when you say I have an apartment building you, know, you can do a deal within 60 days, 30 days sure. conditions, 30 days closing. Because there's income. There's income, and it's you know it's very simple in the sense that you have a rent roll, you have expenses, you have your net cash, and and then you have the building. How is the building going to look? What is you know the, the uh, parts of the building, and then you can close it. But right. I'd say to answer your question really specifically, is that what motivates me is seeing people get to their goals, mm -hmm. and so you know I am the ultimate purveyor of liquidity of real estate right away, right, as a broker. You are. Um, but, uh, and not me, ultimately, all investment sales brokers, but um, being able to see something from start to finish is just incredible. And being able to create something is, is the best. But I would say, honestly, the single best thing about our business and what motivates me is relationships. I mean, why we're sitting here right now, you get to meet so many different people, you get to learn about their backgrounds and then eventually you're sitting there smoking hookah in a, a beautiful new house with your friend talking about real estate. I mean, that's how it happened. I mean, our friendship was born through real estate, right? Yeah. Like we, I, I, just to give context to everybody, I, I was in the market to start my development, the development portion of my life. Um, and through a mutual friend, we got connected and all of a sudden, Jared's like, I got, I had a piece of land that I think is right for you, that it, like, it's a good area, it needs some work, and, but like you could probably take it through and it's a good starter piece. Yeah. Um, and that's how, and like through that deal, we got to know each other and then we would have the conversations and 
obviously going through a multi million dollar transaction, you you build relationships with everybody involved, uh, and you are the gatekeeper of those relationships, especially between the buyer and the seller. Uh, and then you realize that the person that's doing the stuff is really cool, and then you become friends. Like that's. And then you drive cars together. And then you drive cars together. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so you are in a really good position to answer the next few questions, which are more market specific to real estate. Uh, where do you think? What is the current state of the Canadian and more specifically Toronto or GTA real estate market? Well, I would say we're effectively about two and a half quarters into a correction. Um, and it's, it's basically using the metric of transactions, number of transactions done, and dollar volume amount of transactions done. So at the height of the market in Toronto, it was roughly $31 billion worth of commercial real estate sold. So that's among all the different asset classes, residential development land, right. um, commercial industrial land, industrial office retail, and then uh, hotels, of course. So um, what's happened is since, uh, third quarter of last year, that volume has dropped dramatically, the transaction volume, like in apartment buildings alone, mm -hmm. um, from 2022 to 2021, that quarter over quarter change was 90% almost, which is crazy. Yeah, so it's dropped off a cliff. So no one's transacting right now. Barely. Yeah. And um, the reason really is obviously because the interest rate rise was so sudden and it was so incredibly large. Yeah. It affected 450 basis points. 450 here, 475 these days. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, what's happened is that the sellers and the buyers are forbidden their ass for way off. Right? And the liquidity of the market, the ability to find credit has become more difficult. There's a number of things that have happened. But you know, now we're into a quarter where things have started to settle a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the dollar volume amount is down, but it's going to continue probably to and uh, the pricing has also changed pretty drastically too. Right. So you have uh, really for apartment building sales, you have about 26% off, uh, off values. And then for development land, you're about 20%. Um, for industrial buildings, 20 to 25%, depending on the type. And industrial land is really kind of uh, a little bit of a tricky one because there are still transactions happening in the pricing levels of last year, but they're holding. Yeah, so seller financing, yeah. Like vendor take back more. Yeah, those are take back, yeah. Right, the seller, seller finance. And how long do you think that lasts? Uh, well, I don't know. You know, it's hard for me to predict the future, but I do like to study the numbers in the past market. And a really good example is if, and to take some insight into it, is if you look at what happened with the industrial land and the industrial building market in 2009 to about 2018. So, what happened is the great financial crisis, it hit massively in the US, obviously. In Canada, we didn't really feel the brunt of it, right. except for in industrial, um, industrial buildings and land. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that a lot of industrial like the distribution center, it's based upon commerce that is more global centric, right? Fair. And so what happened is uh, the dollar volume amount from uh, industrial buildings and industrial land in 2010 uh, really starting in the middle of 2009 to the end of 2009, that dollar volume amount number of transactions dropped by about 50%. Wow. So the entire market dropped and the pricing dropped as well. Mm -hmm. That market did not come back until 2016. You had effectively $1.8 billion of industrial building sales. And that was a little bit higher than 2008, which was the last previous record high. Um, and really, if you look at that time period, it allows you to see that you know the volume amounts, uh, the dollar volumes, the number of transactions, the price, everything gets depressed for a while, and it takes a you know, pretty significant amount of time for the market to come back. Right. And so when you think about things in terms of um, you know fear and greed, I heard this uh, a mentor of mine down in the U.S. talk about this this balance between fear and greed put it so eloquently, but it makes a lot of sense, is that you know, effectively the markets change based on where you have money in the market. And 
available cash in the market. Right. And right now, you know, there's this fear basically pushing down on the market. People are scared. They don't know what to do. With it. But because there's so much capital in the market, um, like I calculated last week, it was close to eight or nine billion dollars just in the GTA of new funds that I know about that are looking to place capital but aren't. Right. You have a lot of capital waiting to move into the market. And so when that fear starts to diminish, mm-hmm. when people start to be a little more you know, quote green, then you'll see the market pick back up. So yeah. and if you had to I like I'm not putting on the spot obviously this isn't an economic podcast, but we can make one. Uh, we're two and a half quarters into it. Do we have another quarter to go, two quarters, like when do you see this coming back to like not record highs in 21, 22? Because I think those are going to be a little while to catch up. But when do you start to see that equilibrium take place again? That's a good question. I mean, when you look at our 10 year moving average for the different asset classes, that's what I kind of like to use as the normal market. Right. Um, uh, you're looking at land sales about four and a half billion dollars. Whereas in 2022 and 2021, they were highlighted. Seven point nine and eight billion dollars worth of land sales, almost double, almost double. Right. right. So you know we're going back towards that ten-year moving average, effectively where things were normally. Right. So were those just bonus years? Mm-hmm. Were they not the norm? Are we going back to a regular market? It's hard to say. We call it correction because the pricing has moved substantially over fifteen percent, and the transaction volume has moved over twenty percent down. Right. So yeah, like you're saying, like how many track? What, what's the like? If four point five is the average, what are what are we tracking in twenty twenty three right now? Twenty twenty three, we're tracking about three and a half billion at the moment. So um, we're still we're still very quiet. Right. And it's then, about sixty percent down. And transaction volume has dropped by almost ninety percent. Yeah, that was in apartment buildings. Yeah, specifically. But if you look at uh, land residential land sales, it's about sixty uh, percent. Still. Dramatic, very dramatic. Yeah. So, I mean, we talk about the fear and greed ratio. Uh, like, for there's really two main parts that compose that, that like make transactions happen: uh, construction costs and sales price. So, I'm gonna ask you about both of those. Uh, where do you see construction costs now, as as it relates to like the ten year normal? Like, are we above, below, and then do you see them trending up or down? Good question. I mean, I, I, I assume that they're going to go down partially. There's just too much pressure on the construction industry um, to you know, move more downwards. I, I would assume they go down, but I don't know. And I, the best thing I can do is look back at history. And right. so there was a study done by Altus. And they said over the course of all the past recession, construction costs have decreased on average about 6% in the GTA. Okay. It's not massive. No. But we were in a period of extreme instability in the supply and demand chain, right? right? And so you have a construction period that really got completely out of balance. There wasn't enough people to build the buildings that we were selling. Right. right? So you have 30, 40,000 units being sold, well, it was you know, the best year was 36,000, but you can only really build about 15 to 18,000 per year. So no matter what you do, you're never going to be able to you know, find that equilibrium. So right. now that things are settling, you will likely see pressure to back off of that. But of course, you know, if I charge you a dollar to build one brick mm-hmm. and now you know I don't have any work, I still have to go pay for that brick, I have to pay for the people to set it, and they still want to be paid the same because the cost of living has increased. Right. So that's why when you look at these studies, construction costs haven't decreased massively. Mm-hmm. You know, so you can guess they're going to be somewhere between six and ten percent uh, on the going down. Yeah, decreasing. Yeah. So that's the one side of the equation. Uh, now, before I before you answer this next question, I, uh, maybe give some context to people. Uh, so. Toronto, the GTA, Canada are in a housing crisis. Like, so can we talk about that? Like, let's sidebar that before I ask about the demand side of the equation. Like, where, can you explain that to us? 
I've explained it a couple of times on my own, but it, it's nice to hear it from somebody else that has a different view on it. Where, where do you see us in, in that demand pendulum, and what do you think gets us out of it? That's a good question. Um, the easiest way to understand it is that we have a population that is growing by you know, roughly almost 2% in some cases per year. Right. And so we have a housing stock right now that is uh, in its inability to grow at that 2% is causing the housing prices because we have costs um, that are increasing because there's too much demand. So the best way to explain it is we have We'll use Toronto, for example, sure. and Ontario. We have roughly 250,000 people moving into Ontario per year. Um, and maybe I should use Toronto more specifically because I don't know the numbers outside of the GTA, but we have roughly 100,000 people moving into Toronto per year. Mm -hmm. um, you need to house all those 100,000 people. For sure. And if you only have the construction industry building about 18,000 units per year, yeah. that means you're only really dealing with um, roughly 50 to 60,000 of those people per year. Yeah. So you have 40,000 people that are trying to find housing every year and they're competing against other people to find that housing. Right. So if we have uh, five water bottles on the table and there's three people or rather uh, and seven, to, yeah. seven to eight people in the room and you all need to drink in order to live. Yeah. And you have money to pay for these water bottles. You're going to bid up the cost of those water bottles until you actually get one. And the last people won't actually have one, so they're waiting around for the next time, and they're willing to be more aggressive for the next water bottle that comes along. Right, because they really want to drink. Well, yeah, right. So you have this weird cascading effect of why we have all these bidding wars because you have this like, say for example, your family you enter into the market. To buy a house, you're like, oh, I have a reasonable budget. Here's my budget. Oh, wait a second, I actually can't buy that house. You go bid on a bunch of houses. All of a sudden, after three or four months, you're realizing, oh no, I need to move, I need to find a place, and I actually can't buy what I want. Mm -hmm. So you increasingly get more and more aggressive to get what you want because right. there's no supply for you to find it, which right. propels the market. Propels so, the market. To get yeah. higher and higher. It's very simple. So that's an excellent segue into this. So, we talked about construction and we talked about like the broader real estate market. Where do you see sales prices and demand going in the next one, two, five, ten years? Well, I think right now we're not going to see them move substantially. I think they're going to stay very flat. And that's simply because of the actual cost to buy has been flipped upside down. So when you look at there's a really good data set done by national banks where you look at the average cost to buy something, the average mortgage, and then the average rent. Right. And that balance is where you get people looking more to rent versus buy. Uh -huh. Right now, it's flipped upside down. Your average mortgage is $4,400 a month, whereas your average rental unit is $2,400 a month. Right. So there is a massive discrepancy between what you can afford and what you can actually live in. And so I think most people right now are saying, I can't afford $4,400. But I can afford 24, 2500 because I'm going to go rent. So we're right now seeing record level increases on rental rates. Right. We are seeing the sales price uh, very sticky, not really moving. So I would say in the next one to three years, we're probably not going to see the sales price for condos move substantially unless they're like examples of very specialized product right. in neighborhoods and you know, it's more New York, York. downtown. Nuanced areas, yeah. but on average, you're not going to see it move. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to go back to like 2011 to 2014. Uh, the market there had dealt with the brunt of the great financial crisis. Everyone was very um, careful, mm -hmm. and you saw the market basically go sideways when it comes to pricing. So, do you think that that equilibrium has to between 4,400 and 20? I can't remember. Sorry, you said 20. What's average rent? The average rent is 2,400. So there's a two thousand dollar discrepancy yeah. per month. Yeah. So you're gonna to need to see that yeah. level off a little bit before it, the renters are like, okay, now I can afford. The rent. There's no difference in whether I buy or rent, and I don't put the cost down, gain the equity, and all that stuff. Exactly. So that's like in the immediate term. 
But then how does that how does that tie in with our broader, you know, we have the capacity to build like twenty thousand units and we take forty and but we need forty thousand units in any given year. Yeah, that's a good question. That's why I think most people that build and develop and buy and invest in Toronto look at Toronto long term and say, I'm bullish still. Right. But in the next five years, is there going to be a lot of difficulty caused through the excess amount of uh, debt, um, the increase of interest rates? You know, that's I think where people see things like oh, they just got too overheated. And so now, you know, when you look at the pandemic, you essentially take this big complex economic wheel and you completely halt it to a stop artificially by the government you know, saying oh, we need to protect people here. Right. That caused all this excess problems because they just got too ahead of themselves, right? In the sense, you know, they thought, you know, we need to increase all the cash in the market. We need to put out that. And listen, I'm not a policymaker and by no means criticizing what happened. I think it was done, it was done, and it was necessary. But of course, now we're dealing with all the issues of you know $14 trillion of money pumped into the system around the world. Mm -hmm. And now it's coming back out. So we're having this, you know, effective um, you know, vacuum effect. Right. All the money that's coming back and the market is kind of taking its pause and it, we're in this. Uh... So if you're an investor or you want to get into real estate investment, what's the move? Well, it, like number one, you have to look at where, what is your dollar amount you have? What is your budget? You have to look at what asset class you want to do. Mm -hmm. And then you have to have your deal team so you know what you're doing. Your lawyers, everything. Set yourself up to do the real estate properly. Right. Talk to an investment sales broker who knows what they're doing. Um, make sure you have a true understanding of how much cash you have, or if you're a syndicator, how much cash you can raise. Right. So you, but you're talking about when one. I'm going to call you out because that was a bit too political of an answer. Yeah. Like what if Jeremiah is an investor? He's not a real estate full-time professional because a lot of the money that comes into real estate is not real estate professionals it's doctors lawyers dentists pharmacists and yeah. other professionals coming in and saying i want to diversify from what i'm doing yeah. day to day and so therefore i'm gonna i want to invest in the commercial real estate something in yeah so what is again the advice is like what where would you recommend that they go they start they do Okay, that's a good question. So I think number one, it does depend on your risk. You know, how much risk do you want to take? Right. If you're look, let's just use for the assumption that you're looking for a balanced risk and you're a long-term hold. You want to see income coming in. You want to see the growth of what you believe is Canada and Toronto. What What is long term? Just so that we're on the same. I'm expecting. like ten years. Ten years. Okay. Yeah. And it's hard to guess what's ten years out, but let's just say five to ten years. Right. I mean, the data points. To buying apartments and buying and building rental buildings. I mean, right now, it's the single biggest economic factor that is driving the rental market. Right. Now, of course, you have to find the right parcel of land. That makes sense. Um, but ultimately, you know, land is just a percentage of residual of the entire building. Right. And if you believe in the growth in rental rates, you can effectively get any deal done. So I, I would say that's one of my favorite asset classes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because the numbers are so there. Listen, it costs forty five hundred dollars to hold a home, forty four hundred. Yeah, but you can rent for twenty four hundred. That means, just in normal terms, you're going to go and you're going to rent. You're not going to buy. Right, because like even if you're paying a mortgage, you're not forty four hundred. Uh, like you're not paying two thousand dollars in principal every month. So you're 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 effectively paying more because you're paying interest and all that stuff. So is exactly. that your net? You're net up renting and keeping that money and doing something else with it. Um, okay, great, great advice there. <laughs> I, lost my, uh, I would say, for the record, if you have greater risk propensity and you can look 10 years out, yeah, buy office buildings right now. Okay, can we talk about that for, for a second? What, uh, what's the story with office? Like, can you, can you just like, like context that office has crashed basically? Over the last basically since COVID, and, and everybody all of a sudden started working from home, and even big companies don't need as much space as they once did, so you have a lot of vacancy. Uh, 
What is the opportunity there? Well, it, that's a difficult one. And I will say right now that this is a very risky endeavor. I don't know what's in the future. Yes. <laughs> All of your politically yeah. correct like um, practices to the end. That's right. Yeah. Um, um, but I, I really like you just sold a large office building to an investor who wants to own for his family for the next 20 years. So and you, so you think it comes back? I think it comes back. Does it come back to the same level it was before? Yeah. Maybe not, right? Because you had a paradigm shift in how people work, right? You had people deciding that we're going to now work from home because we have all the necessities to do our job properly and we don't have the commute. Right. And for the record, I would say most people are, are social beings. They like to be in the office. That's a good one. You know, the majority, there are some that don't. Yeah. But um, people hate the commute. Mm -hmm. And especially in cities like Toronto and some of these, you know, Montreal and Vancouver where the traffic's horrible, um, people are choosing to stay at home as it's a greater benefit to them than commuting than being in the office on a social level. Right. Because we have to we have to understand the fact that most jobs, depending on what type of role you're in, you do better when you're in person. Mm -hmm. You're able to read uh, someone, you see you know, the nonverbal communication, you have ideas just by walking by and saying something, you have these kind of uh, you know effective impromptu meetings, of course, and things help go quicker right yeah. now with that said if you are someone who is you know an actuarial scientist and you're a data scientist um, or computer or programmer, computer programmer yeah. and you're just focused on a small task every day and you're doing that and you want to be in the office yeah of course and yeah. even some lawyers they're not in the office you know some engineers so i think it, it's going to be very role specific we are going to have we are continuing to have a major correction in Office building sales, but if you are long enough <laughs> in your outlook, you understand that very good locations and good offices are always going to be in demand. Right. And there are new uses now, like life sciences, lab uses, data center spaces, um, co working spaces where you can actually you know, partner with a co worker and manage it and make it more of a center of community. There are different uses that are making. So that would be on the riskier scale of you know, commercial real estate investing. Right. You do need more capital. You have to be very careful with your budget. You know, the building we're selling right now is a large office and we're doing a budget of for 10 years. We're basically telling the person you have to have enough cash for three to five years to deal with a big building. You have to be stomach it. You have to stomach it, right? And you got to work backwards and see if that still sets the return you want. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, office buildings are being sold at in some cases, significant discount, right? Because right now there's uncertainty in that market. Okay, so we've talked about the real estate market at large and, and where we think there's opportunities or where you think there's opportunities. Um, I want to get a little bit more personal and just so people can get to know you and like what makes you tick and all that stuff. Um, so a question here: because you are a deal junkie, but you are incredibly good at what you do. Uh, is there ever a time where you see yourself moving out of brokerage and into another part of real estate? <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, I'd say no right now. I'm really enjoying it. Um, enjoy working with all the people and building the relationships and seeing the complex deals and, and finding liquidity for owners. So right now, I can't see that, but you can never say no. If you were ever going to do it, where would it be? Or like, what would it be? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I would be in real estate somewhere, I think. Yeah. Uh, I know that I, I could probably do something in raising capital for others who maybe don't have exposure to real estate and mm -hmm. helping them invest that. So maybe a fund of sorts, yeah. um, I think would be good. Um, but, you know, at this point, I'm really enjoying what I'm doing and we're building the team here in Toronto and actually Montreal now, Quebec, and, and this, uh, Windsor Quebec City corridor being the second largest uh, or the largest rather population of Canadian um, residents, mm -hmm. uh, 18 million people. I think servicing and creating this team along this corridor is my goal right now. So. Very cool, very cool. Well, listen, if you ever start the fund, uh, I'll, <laughs> you know what thing or two. I'll throw some dollars on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, biggest professional mistake that you've made 
and what it is you choose. Pretty professional mistake that was made. Mm. I think uh, the professionals, like probably early on in my career, I didn't get into sales right away. Mm -hmm. um, I spent almost uh, two and a bit years on the non-sale side. Right. And then it's, uh, I really enjoyed my time as an analyst. Uh, because you get to understand all the markets really well. You get to see all the transactions, the different asset classes. But you know, looking back at them now, you know, I probably would have gotten into it a little bit sooner. So it was maybe, you know, if you know you have a propensity towards a certain type of role, mm -hmm. you know, do the best you can to get into it sooner rather than later is kind of my advice. So it was just more like picking the path that you want to go down as opposed to like a mistake in that path that like kind of set you off. You've had a pretty stellar career. Like once you got into the sales <laughs> point, you've done all right. So well, I I, I would also say that I didn't uh, concentrate heavily on my brokerage business um, until a few years into. I started a few other businesses too. Right. Um, oh, like spreading out your time too thin. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, I was you know a born entrepreneur, but I just didn't focus. And it's actually because Collier did used to be publicly traded. We had you know, we were a little more entrepreneurial shop. I just didn't have as much focus. And I say, once you figure out what you want to do, because I knew very early on I only wanted to do investment sales. Right. Figure out that focus and hyper-focus in that segment, and then your education, all that information will compound. Right. Because the more you specialize and the more you focus, every year, the small little things you do will compound on the year before. And so all of a sudden, you have this incredible amount of knowledge You've been doing these small little things for years and years and years, and then you look back at 10 years and you're like, whoa, you accomplished a lot. It's like the inches. The inches that I add up to the mile, right? It's, it's so true. Yeah. And, and the best advice I can give to young people, too, is that you're never going to know exactly what you want to do. I mean, there are exceptions, of course, but you're always going to think, I want to do this 55% versus 45%, right? You're going to have a little more propensity towards something. Right, and that's kind of what I had looking back. I didn't know perfectly what I wanted to do, but I knew, okay, I think I want to do this, and I think it's going to be this, right? Right. Things are never going to be perfect. Right. And the best way to think about it is you're driving on the highway, you're taking a long road trip. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you veer a little bit out of your lane, and you come back into it, right? Yeah. There's nothing wrong with veering out of that lane. It's just the idea to keep focused and coming back into that lane. So. Right. And that's the best advice I could ever give is don't worry about absolutes. Figure out something, hyper focus, work on it, compound that every day. And then you're going to learn by doing what are your mistakes, right? You're going to learn, okay, I don't like doing that. Okay, I will now shift to this, right? Right. So you have to make steps in order to shift. And so the best thing I ever learned early on when I realized that I wanted to hyper focus and around the time founded the private capital group and worked with our company to kind of give that service offering, um, I realized that um, through hyper-focusing, I was going to start doing exactly what I was doing every single day. Mm -hmm. And that was going to lead me down a path that would you know, you know, bring some success. I mean, I, I do want to highlight one thing because it, it's, it's worth speaking about. You are about as entrepreneurial a person as I know but you work inside an organization, right? There's, uh, I guess there, there, there's a common belief that entrepreneurs are always on their own and they're doing it by themselves, for themselves, like forever. Uh, but that's not always the case, right? Like you, you find the system that you work in and sometimes you have to create that system as an entrepreneur, but especially in real estate, you. There, there are multiple systems and multiple companies that you can work for where it allows you to flex your entrepreneurial spirit, muscle, and stay ultra focused on what it, but allowing you to stay ultra focused on what it is that you truly want to do or the skill set that you think you have. I think that that's massive, uh, and, and it's encouraging to people. And you already took my my next question, which is what advice you have for young people. Uh, I guess maybe. What advice on that on that same line? Like, what advice do you have to somebody for somebody who's looking to get into real estate? Like, maybe they're they're an entrepreneur or they're 
just sitting on the sidelines saying, hey, like, I want to make real estate my full-time gig. What do you tell that person? Yeah, it's a very good question. I get that asked quite a bit. And I think you have to center on what you enjoy. So say you enjoy the analytical side of things. Say you enjoy the construction side of things. Or maybe you have some money you want to start buying. Um, I think you have to focus on what you know. Right. And so say, for instance, you want to invest in real estate. The best thing you can do is start to figure out what skills do I need to own in order to do that. And then I need to just go out and start looking for deals. Right. And just do. So there's actually, I'm going to give a plug to a mentor of mine, but James Nelson just wrote a book called The Insider's Edge to Real Estate Investing. And I'm actually posting them in a, um, an interview on my Twitter spaces on uh, April 27th about his new book. And this book is incredible. Um, I'm almost finished reading it right now, but it's it's kind of the framework with how you invest in your real estate, commercial real estate specific, and what are the different asset classes and how do you set that up. Right. And so I would say to those who want to do that, either look to co-invest with someone, either through a fund or through a friend that you trust, right. <laughs> um, or through public entities, right? So uh, do something and get some understanding of it. And then if you want to do it on your own, Start to build that out by going to look at real estate, looking at deals. Mm -hmm. It's the best thing you can do is just go out and look. Understand your market. Understand your market. Real estate is hyper focused to geography. So pick a neighborhood and start to learn every building on that neighborhood and start to understand what the rents are, um, how much it costs to build, Mm -hmm. and start to understand that to the point where you can actually, hey, I can take a dollar here and I know I can buy this for one dollar. And I also know that I can rent it out for. Mm-hmm. because of the information that I figured out. Right. And so the best thing, the best advice I always give people is that number one, um, start to do no matter what. Right. Just go out and start reading and doing, finding deals. Right. Okay. And number two, the best thing you can do is actually talk to people who are doing it. Right. Figure out. And then either co-invest alongside them and figure out what they're doing, emulate how they're doing it. Uh, I'm to that point, and, I, and you've mentioned this a few times through our conversation today. Uh, the role of mentors, and, and like you, you've already like through this conversation, with literally every set of questions we've asked, you you've referenced a different mentor that you've had that's allowed you to gain insight and not have to do it alone. Like that's such an important piece to self growth and, and career advancement surround yourself with people that have done it before and that can teach you things without you having to necessarily learn it the ultra hard way that you're doing it yourself. Uh, Okay, final two questions. Uh, Do you do any real estate investing yourself? Yeah, I do invest um, not directly into real estate because I don't like to compete against my clients there, Uh, but I invest into funds where other people are Needing that real estate. Um, I also own you know, some REITs uh, that don't trade in our market here, but you know, basically I enjoy real estate. I understand it. So mm-hmm. you know, I continue to do a lot of investing, mostly in the US. Right. Um, but there are some deals in Toronto that I'm in where people have invited me in to invest alongside others and I'm not in conflict and it's not me making the decisions, it's not me who brought the deal. Right. You're backing somebody that you believe in. Yeah, I'm, and I'm not even backing in totality. It's just, just a little bit. A little yeah. Piece. <laughs> um, and then finally, before I let you go, because I've seen your phone blown up, uh, what's next? What's next? Well, um, along with my partner in Montreal, we're building out a private capital team to effectively have more uh, tracking of different markets and continue to give good service to million owners and landowners um, along Hamilton, Toronto, Ottawa, Gatineau, Montreal, Quebec City, along these corridors so that we can find more liquidity for owners and give them more of the ability to find that liquidity event. Because I only represent owners, I only represent uh, the selling side. And so that's how, you know, the first time you were buying a deal from me, I was selling a building Retail Plaza that had some development upside, right? And you 
came alongside and you said, listen, I, I saw this, I know we're connected through friends, can I talk to you, I want to buy this. And we started talking and ended up Absolutely. buying that. And side note, I don't know if you remember this, and I feel so bad. Right when you would put in the offer, we got another competing offer. And I remember calling you and being like, listen, I know everyone says that there's always a competing <laughs> offer. I do remember. And because we don't know each other, I'm telling you that I always work on a very honest basis. This just did come in. It was someone who's talking to us before. So yeah. sorry about that. And no, you're like, oh, come on. I, oh, I'm I, I, I'll it's the you. nature of the business. I, you were so professional to deal with. Like, I deal with a lot of brokers, and like, not just in my buying nature for myself. Like, I, before I did it for myself, I did it for other professionals. The way I did it for two companies before I did it on my own. Uh, Dealt with gamut of brokers, the way that you dealt with that, and even I've, I've been a buyer dealing with you, I've also been a seller dealing with you. I've enjoyed both of those things. You are an extremely honest person, but yeah. uh, like that kind of goes with the territory, right? I, yeah. Yeah. I think eventually, if you're factual enough with people, they appreciate it. They yeah. can become long term relationships like you and I. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, listen, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I This is this podcast was like chock full of like really good both data and insight. So uh, I'm so appreciative that you took the time to be here with us. Um, if you ever are looking to sell a building, Jeremiah is definitely <laughs> somebody <laughs> with high, high, high New York Portland. I would definitely highly recommend. Yeah. Uh, him and his team are top notch at what they do. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks, guys. It's been awesome. This has been fun just to get back and have some general discussions and I look forward to all the deals we're going to do in the future. Amen to that. Amen <laughs> to that. Well, that's our episode for today. Jeremiah, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this episode was chock full of insight um, and real estate knowledge. Uh, to catch more full length episodes of the podcast, you can tune in to fastandhanna.com. That's B-A-S-E-M-H-A-N-N-A.com. Uh, our, the Video recordings are also on YouTube and then audio recordings can be found on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Till next time, have a great day.